Good evening. Welcome to tonight's event. Um, I'm Jacob Renneker, the director of the Johnny Wedzo Foundation. Um, and I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody who's here uh, and uh, give you just kind of a quick recap of what we're um, trying to do here with this year's Come Follow Me uh, 2022 conversation series. Um, so ultimately, the purpose of the Johnny Wedzo Foundation is to inspire members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to engage in meaningful interfaith dialogue and community outreach uh, in order to strengthen our local communities around the world. So uh, as you know, this year's uh, Come Follow Me uh, curriculum uh, and uh, church-wide study of uh, the Old Testament presents us with a unique opportunity uh, for church members to better understand and learn from our uh, Jewish uh, friends and neighbors. Um, and as a, as a religious tradition, uh, our Jewish neighbors have been engaging with this scripture for a few thousand years or so. Um, and so because of that, there's a wealth of, uh, of knowledge uh, and um, you know, really useful um, um, information and approaches for understanding this text and making it uh, meaningful and relevant for us. So we're very much looking forward to, uh, to these series of conversations with our, with our Jewish friends and neighbors. Um, so each, each month we're going to be um, hosting an online conversations uh, similar to what we did last year um, with the uh, Doctrine and Covenants and Church History, um, where uh, this year uh, each month we'll be uh, in uh, hosting an online conversation with a leader or scholar from the Jewish community about an upcoming topic from the Come Follow Me uh, schedule. So uh, tonight's event um, is, of course, about uh, Genesis 2 and 3, the Garden of Eden. Um, so, uh, and then following, uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit at the uh, end of the event, uh, how we're going to be regularly um, producing these events for 2022. So um, with this event and series as a whole, it's our hope that by providing Latter-day Saints with an interfaith oriented series uh, and featuring members of the Jewish community that uh, will hopefully provide um, you, our audience, with uh, something uniquely valuable that isn't available uh, elsewhere. Um, conversations that aren't happening um, in other corners, but uh, we have uh, a number of, of really good, really bright, um, really thoughtful uh, Jewish uh, colleagues. We thought it would be great to, to sit down and have, have some conversations with them about, about these scriptures. Um, so ultimately, we believe that this program will help educate uh, Latter-day Saints uh, about the rich history of Jewish scriptural uh, interpretation and application. And hopefully we can model uh, meaningful interfaith conversations uh, and empower Latter-day Saints, uh, including you, dear audience, uh, to, to be able to do the same uh, in your own communities with your Jewish friends, as well as friends of, of other faiths. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned at the top of, uh, of the hour, I'm Dr. Jacob Renneker. Um, I'm the Scholar-in-Residence uh, and Director of the John A. Widso Foundation, and I'm going to be the host for this uh, Come Follow Me uh, Interfaith Conversation Series. Um, so my personal background is in ancient scripture and comparative religion, um, and I'm also a member of the Jewish Latter-day Saint Academic Dialogue Project, which our uh, guest Tamar is also uh, a part of. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for this personally. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, we'll have a, a, a whole a slew of incredibly kind and thoughtful um, and brilliant, really, uh, Jewish thinkers about um, the book that uh, Christians call uh, the Old Testament and uh, which Jews call the Hebrew Bible. So for a conversation this evening um, in uh, Genesis 2 through 3, Garden of Eden from a Jewish perspective, um, as we as we continue through this conversation, at any time, uh, you can submit a question using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your uh, little Zoom panel. Um, so please, if you have a question at any point, uh, enter it there. Um, and if you see a question that you would also like answered, you have the opportunity to uh, upvote. So you can vote for that question to be asked and we'll uh, try to pay attention to those questions that are most interesting uh, to the audience members, uh, which is you. Uh, and um, so we'll be tackling those questions at about third, uh, two thirds of the way through the event. So at about 20 till or so, we'll start working our way through those questions. Um, 
and uh, we'll, we're looking forward to hearing what, uh, what you have to, to, to ask uh, our good friend here, uh, Dr. Frank Hill. So um, lastly, before I introduce uh, Tamar, um, you can find video replays of this and all of our uh, previous events, along with uh, links to uh, podcast recordings that we'll start uh, producing here. Uh, and those will all be uh, made available at the Woodso Foundation's website, www.woodsofoundation.org. So that's been way too much of me talking. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our uh, guest uh, and friend tonight, Dr. Tamar Frankiel. Uh, Tamar is the former president and provost of the Academy for Jewish Religion in California. She's authored several important books on Jewish spiritual life and religion, such as uh, Loving Prayer, A Study Guide to Everyday Jewish Prayer, and The Voice of Sarah, Feminine Spirituality and Traditional Judaism. Uh, Tamar and her husband, Herschel, have lived in California for more than three decades, mostly in Los Angeles. Uh, Herschel, uh, Tamar's husband, was born in Poland and survived the Holocaust as a child uh, hidden by a Polish family. Um, uh, together, uh, Tamar and Herschel have five children and 14 grandchildren who live everywhere from Los Angeles to Chicago to Jerusalem to London and to Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and just kind of on a personal note, uh, Tamar is, uh, is a great person. Uh, she's also, I mentioned, a uh, member of the Latter-day Saint Jewish Academic Dialogue uh, Project. So I've gotten to, to you know, know her uh, pretty well uh, over the past uh, several years. Uh, and she's just, yeah, inc incredibly generous, kind, um, and makes you feel smarter and better than you actually are. So Tamar, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to spend some time with you tonight. Um, so, so, so first off, um, something I thought would be helpful for our, um, for our audience to know who are, are, are Latter-day Saints. Um, what sort of things do you wish that Christians, uh, kind of in general, Latter-day Saints being part of the Christian tradition, what do you, what would you hope that Christians would understand better about the way that their Jewish neighbors approach interpreting scripture uh, in general? Thank you, Jacob, for that beautiful introduction. And um, it's wonderful to be here with you tonight. So um, looking forward to this as a conversation and, and to the questions that people will bring. Um, yes, I think one of the things that's sometimes difficult for Christians to understand, especially if um, you're coming from a very authoritative tradition, which has um, a, a, a descended tradition through generations and generations, and where certain people rise up as authorities. Because on the surface, if you look at Jewish tradition, it seems to be the same. There are important biblical commentators. There are schools that teach uh, the interpretation of the, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, but once you get involved in it, you realize it actually has a much more intimate, um, conversational almost, uh, character to the study of scripture. The, the, the Hebrew Bible is the word of God, transmitted first through Moses and then through other prophets and holy writers. And yet at the same time, it is from the beginning, from very early on in Judaism, conceived of as a conversation between the generations that has to evolve in a certain sense. It has limitations and structures that, um, that control that evolution. And certainly the respect for real scholars of the tradition where, you know, overrides some of the other things that people might just come up with in this conversation. But there really is uh, an effort th that to make clear that the, the text is speaking to us personally, and we have to come personally to it and, uh, and as communities come to it and find a way to understand it that's in our language and our time, um, even though it's you know, from, from the ancient, from the, from the wisest um, sources that we know. So, and then there's a whole range of literature that involves 
evolves out of that. And that what that's what a lot of Christians don't realize is there's just tomes and tomes and tomes of commentaries on the Torah that people can bring into the conversation. Great. So. Excellent. So you mentioned and you used the term uh, Hebrew Bible, and I think it'd be helpful for our audience, right? So, uh, you know, Christians have an Old Testament because there's a New Testament, uh, right? So work, you know, Jesus, apostles, uh, writings of apostles uh, constitute the New Testament and also accept as, as uh, you know, authoritative the, the, the Old Testament. But for the Jewish community who does not accept as canonical, you know, as, as authoritative, these writings of the life and teachings of Jesus and Jesus's disciples. Um, it's just the, the Torah, the, the, the Bible, right? So Hebrew Bible. So if we use that term tonight, Hebrew Bible, Hebrew Bible equals Old Testament, essentially, um, right there. Um, so that's, you know, that, that is, that is very, very helpful and interesting um, about that idea of kind of scripture being a conversation or interpretation being kind of a, a conversation and a necessary conversation or an expected uh, conversation. Uh, I really, I really like that idea. And so is, is it safe to say then that whereas in some Christian communities that there, you know, are, you know, say this is the interpretation of this particular scripture, um, and that might be similar from community to, com to community and different Christian congregations. Um, is, is it, would that would that be the same in you know if you go to a different synagogue? Uh, how how similar will some of these interpretations or or, or traditions of interpretation? How, how similar would those be? If you could speak to that for just a second. Um, widely, widely different in in style and and usually with certain common threads of substance i guess is the way it's it's like a tree you know there's a trunk everybody recognizes the trunk but the branches can go many different directions and and well i'll i'll give some examples of that in the in the passages that we're dealing with uh tonight but but there is for example it's expected that someone who knows Hebrew is going to be more authoritative than someone who's working only from an English translation. It's expected that for the, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the prime commentator that everyone should look at first is an, a guy from the 11th century known as Rashi, that's the, the acronym, we use acronyms for names, uh, Rabbi Shlobo ben Isaac, who lived in France. Why? Because he was a master of the Talmud, uh, which is a whole body of legal commentary. He was a master of all the books of the Bible. And he taught five-year-olds. <laughs> it's like, so the, you know, it's like Rashi. Nobody, Christians usually haven't heard of Rashi, but nobody would think about doing a serious investigation of a piece of, of Bible without looking at what, what Rashi says, and then all the people who argue with him. Great. And I like, yeah, the people who argue, right? So, so the, 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 the conversation uh, that's happening sometimes can get a bit heated uh, <laughs> between different uh, you know, interpreters uh, of scripture. And that's, yeah, I, I like that. That's more entertaining and engaging uh, <laughs> for me as a, uh, as a reader. So great. So that, 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 I think that's some helpful background information. Some of these things might come up as, as, as we go along, but let's, let's go ahead and, and, and focus on, on Genesis 2 to 3, right? The, the story of the Garden of Eden. So coming from the creation narrative, um, creation story in Genesis 1, now to kind of focusing on uh, Genesis 2 and 3 and what's happening in Eden. Um, what are some of your favorite uh, uh, Jewish you know, in, interpreters from some of these different interpretive traditions or interpreters, uh, what, what are some that you appreciate or that you find most interesting uh, from, from that wealth of, of interpretive tradition? Right. So one thing, you know, there's supposed to be a kind of basic plain meaning level of most of what we read in the Torah. It's the plain meaning of the law sometimes, or the plain meaning of the, the story, this happened. But it's clear from the commentaries on Genesis two and three that 
this is not your normal story. <laughs> this story does not happen according to the normal laws of nature. This story is, is on some other level. And that's one of the things that makes it fascinating. Um, but it also means that one must do interpretation. Um, so for example, the fact that Adam and Eve are born adults. I mean, they're adults. They don't have, they were never babies. They went, don't have a family. They don't have parents. Um, the Talmud uh, says they were 20 years old, as if 20 years old when they, when they were created. How were they created? Were they created um, first Adam and then Eve? But there's also an interpretation that says they were actually created together. Um, uh, there's a, a story which I, I in the in the Talmud I love because it it kind of brings very vividly to life um, the both the impossibility and the intensity of this, which says like this: Adam and Eve's first day on Earth is divided into twelve hours. That is, the the daytime hours. In the first hour. Adam's clay is heaped up. In the second, he becomes an inert mass. In the third, his limbs extend. In the fourth, he is in, infused with the soul. In the fifth, he stands in his feet. In the sixth, he gave names to all of creation. In the seventh, Eve becomes his mate. And in the eighth, they ascended into the bed as two and descended as four, namely Cain and Abel were born. <laughs> in the ninth, he was commanded not to eat of the tree. In the 10th, he went astray. In the 11th, he was judged. And then the 12th, he was expelled and departed. <laughs> so just that, oh yeah, this was, this was all going on in the space of like half of a 24 hour day. If you understand yeah. it literally or, or figuratively, either way, it's a very intense story. Um, the, yeah, the other piece was a, uh, that I wanted to mention is that there's a discussion about what it means when it says Eve, was created from one of Adam's ribs. Uh, one uh, opinion holds that it didn't mean rib, but it meant side, like a wall. And that actually this was an androgynous being, um, either side to side or back to back. And that actually it wasn't so much taking a piece of Adam and then forming uh, the woman from him, but of, of separating an originally androgynous being so they could turn face to face, which is, just, I like that one. That's great. Yeah. Um, and you, so you mentioned, you mentioned the, the term Talmud. And so I think maybe that might be helpful for our audience to, to define what that is, how that is different from, uh, you know, the, the text of the Bible. Hebrew mm -hmm. Bible itself and uh, Midrash. Maybe if you could differentiate a couple of those for us, that might be helpful kind of moving forward. Yes, thanks for asking. Uh, so you have the Bible, which is the Torah, which is just the first five books of the Bible, um, the Torah of Moses. And then there's all those scriptures, which you know from as the Old Testament. And then um, in after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the rabbis, um, as they came to be called, they were beginning to be called rabbis then, but the rabbis of the next several generations gathered together all the oral traditions that they could remember, and perhaps some of them had written down pieces of, and they gathered them <clears throat> into, first of all, a body of law called the Mishnah. And then commentaries on that, it took them, it was over generations, took them, um, the Mishnah was completed around the year 200 CE. And then for another three to four centuries, yeah, two to three centuries at least, um, the rabbis added more and more commentaries. That became the Talmud. And there's actually two versions of the Talmud, one from the Babylonian community, one from the, uh, Jerusalem um, or Palestinian community of Jews. And those are what are called the Talmud. Midrash is yet another collection of writings. Some of the stories that are in the Midrash also appear in Talmud, but it's another voluminous collection of writings that are mainly stories and homilies. They're more like moral 
um, interpretations and explanations of, of the stories in the Bible. They don't usually have a legal, um, a legal significance like the Talmud does. And when you use the term uh, legal or legally, how does that, what does that mean in Jewish life in general? All those rules that Jews have to <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. in, which also get discussed over centuries uh, a lot. Yeah, basically the interpretations of the legal portions of the Hebrew Bible, which are mostly in the books of Exodus and Leviticus and, and Numbers and then an overview and a few more new ones in Deuteronomy, then how do you apply those in life? Those are the questions that the Mishnah and then the Talmud ask. Excellent, excellent, good, good. I think that's that's very helpful for our audience. So, um, thanks for that. Okay, yeah. So, so we have a few different things. So you mentioned uh, Adam's uh, incredibly full day uh, of of action there. Uh, that was that was that from that was from the Talmud. That is from um, yes, the Talmud, the book, the tractate Sanhedrin. Yes. Okay, okay. and then the other one uh, that was talking about. Yeah, and that's uh, the midrash together. about the construction of Adam's Adam and Eve's body and how that happens. There are several different traditions about this, but it's midrashic. Okay, great, 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 excellent. So I think yeah, that's that's those are some fun uh, that that idea that you, you mentioned that you know that the, it's it's an interpretation that that you like, right? That the back to back and then like separated so that they could then be face to face in being separated. What, what is it about that interpretation that does something for you? Um, the, there's, it again is about the, the conversation, right? Whether if people are theoretically join side to side, they can, you know, push something together. They can do certain things with their hands together. If they're joined back to back, it becomes a little more difficult <laughs> to do things together. I don't know what that would be like, but the idea that there was originally a, a oneness and then by separating it made a different kind of relationship possible, a two-ness, uh, knowing of each other, facing meaning that the face is where we interpret most of what another person has to say. So it has to do with that conversation and that, um, that intimacy and, and equality. I don't mean that in a legal sense, but just the sense of facing another person, recognizing, acknowledging another person. I like that. I like that. And that's something that I think that, that in, Christian circles in general that you can't you, that you can tease some of that out uh, looking you know at the language of Genesis a bit uh, but that I think the the default and looking at the relationship of Adam and Eve in Christianity in general has been you know Adam is created first and then Eve is created second and then Adam is put in some you know authoritative position over Eve and that's kind of so it's it's seen as a, a hierarchy uh, sometimes of that relationship that's one of the things I like about that conceptual again if, if this is looking at this as a story and the uh, kind of using your imagination to step into Eden uh, that that idea of of man and woman being part of a whole and then separating and needing to face each other to regain that 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 wholeness that's that's something that that i find really uh compelling and that that wholeness is found in conversation right uh isn't just they're not just kind of smashing back together again and have four arms and four legs to to become uh you know a, a different you know a creature they're not trying to regain that original state or something different but they're unique separate individuals who are in conversation with each other. And I think that's a, that's a great way to see Eden. And then looking at, if you're looking at Eden as the template for life in general or how life, ideal life can be, that that's, uh, I think, a great lesson to, to pull out that, uh, that Christians can, can definitely uh, learn from. So I really, I really like that. Uh, are there other- it's even, oh, ahead, implied, it's even implied in that phrase, uh, a help, God created a helpmate Ezra Kenegbo is the 
is the um, Hebrew, if I have it, if I have it exactly right. And Ezer means helpmate, but Konegbo means a, opposite, opposite him. So that sense of facing, and, and one of the rabbis <clears throat> in the Talmud says, yes, she'll be his helper, but if he does the wrong thing, she's going to tell him, right? She's going to be the one who corrects him. And, and so there's this allowance for uh, a relationship that is not um, necessarily hierarchical, although there are Jewish commentators who do that too. And there um, are Jewish commentators and, and, mid, and Midrashic stories that talk about the problems with the woman, you know, the woman problem <laughs> uh, from, the, from a masculine point of view, basically. And also there are moralistic um, interpretations, you know, what Eve did wrong and what Eve did right, you know, then this is how women should behave or should not behave. Um, that does come up too. One thing that does not, is not prominent, however, is the idea of, of the woman as a uh, sexual temptress, not in most of the, the standard commentaries. There's a kind of um, off, off beat or off a tangent that goes off to the side about there was really another Eve and she was really awful. But, uh, but the woman is not so much the temptress in that because of her body or because of her uh, physicality or her sexuality. She does tempt Adam. She offers him the same fruit she ate, but not doesn't have that other connotation. So that's interesting difference. Yeah, good, good. Um, so with, with Genesis, again, Eden and what's happening there, are there other additional interpretations uh, that, that you've found to be uh, enlightening or uh, or, or, or interesting, and in particular, things that that you don't recognize as much uh, as as being interpretive uh, focuses for uh, Christian uh, general Christian readings of of Genesis. Uh, well, one of the themes that is, gets picked up um, and amplified in Jewish history is that this was the first exile. I mean. Jewish history has emphasized uh, finding one's home and being exiled again over and over and over, whether it's being taken down to, from uh, <clears throat> first Abraham's wandering and then um, later the Jacob and his family being taken down to Egypt and then being in slavery and then going back home and searching for the homeland, all that. And so the there's a sense of the, this is about the first exile and the sins that are presented here in this story are kind of archetypal, not so much about personal sins, although there are certain things you can draw out about obedience and, and um, uh, how you, you know, how you understand instructions and that sort of thing. But um, for some reason, we had to go out, you know, and if, if whether it's simply because of a flaw in human nature um, uh, or rebellion against God, or maybe it was about that tree of knowledge, you know, that there was, we had to somehow eat of the tree of knowledge, but then we couldn't be in the, in the garden in innocence anymore. I like, yeah, I, I like that uh, exile, seeing the Garden of Eden as, you know, kind of the, the first or original kind of exile uh, and why, why that happens and to see that happening repeatedly. Um, and obviously that idea is, is one that resonates strongly with, with the Jewish community because of, a, you know, at a few different points <laughs> um, in, in, in Jewish history. Um, yeah, that, that's, that, that, that's powerful, S seeing it kind of interpreting it as a way of you know, seeing Adam and Eve and their expulsion from Eden as a type of exile, or original exile. See, seeing that I think is, uh, is, 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 it can, can be helpful and, and, and help different things to come up in the story that we don't typically pay attention to if we're looking at it just as this is the story of something that happened to 
to specific people and and their lives, but then looking at it larger about how it kind of foreshadows in a sense the history of of humanity and the Jewish people, right? The covenant people of God and their experiences and and what continues to happen with having to leave again, again, and again, um, but then yet having some tether to God, right? Something original, someplace having to kind of pull, trying, trying to come back and back and back again. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really like that. Um, what yeah. about? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. We, well, first of all, the Latter Day Saint tradition can connect to that too. The the sense of exile and seeking the home, right? Right. Um, but also, then that, that's where Shabbat comes in because Shabbat is like coming back to Eden one day a week. Um, yeah, yeah, so talk, talk a little bit more about that. I mean, that's really Genesis 1 <laughs> rather than 2 and 3. Uh, it's uh, because part of the Shabbat home liturgy is actually in the, um, the description of the seventh day. Uh, but th that this day is in a day in time, which is like, is like the Garden of Eden in, in space and in the archetypal history, the ancient, ancient remem memories of, of home. So um, yeah, it's in, the, it's in the liturgy. And there's a particular, you ask me um, in the questions, is there anything, any little piece of it that connects to, or you asked me if it connects to specific liturgical practices and besides the verses which we say over the wine on Friday night, there's some, a little thing at the end of Shabbat. It's a, a ceremony is called Havdalah, which means to make a distinction between the Sabbath and the other six days of the week. And we have wine and we light um, a candle which is light is also symbolic <clears throat> of the garden, but it's also how we're now we are making fire again. We are back coming into the week. Uh, and <clears throat> and uh, we smell spices, which also reminds us of the, the, how the, the apple on the tree smelled and tasted good. Um, but then when the candles are lit, we look at our fingernails. We look at our fingernails. We, everyone just goes like this, holding them under the, the light of the candle. And everybody does it. <laughs> and I, I just thought, okay, it's just easy to look at your fingernails, right? It turns out that the, there's an interpretation in the Midrash that the cuticles of your fingernails, the little light, the moons as we, uh, we called them when I was young, um, actually are a memory of the skin that the Adam and Eve had before they were exiled, exiled from the garden. What? <laughs> but that's, you know, that's like, you really are remembering something deeper and it's engraved in your fingernails somehow. Mm, interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, I like, I, I really like, yeah, that, that idea of, um, and I think it does, you know, t ties to, you know, to Genesis one, you know, the seventh day of creation, the rest that this, this return to that kind of crowning act of creation, right? God, God resting, everything being uh, good and kind of completed in terms of the initial creation that the Sabbath can be seen as a, a return to that time right a return to eden um and that, that that's that's an image that I, that I find really powerful i think that's that isn't typically how latter-day saints see so to see the sabbath day in a lot of different terms but usually we don't look at uh eden uh you know kind of like free exiled you know adam and eve being being thrown out of the garden um the time before that we don't see the connect sabbath and our, our day of you know rest and rejuvenation and focusing on God, we don't usually connect that with Eden. But I think that's something that's that's definitely worth thinking about for for Latter Day Saints um, and the view, viewing connections there and and as a way to perhaps enrich their weekly Sabbath day experience. Thinking about relations uh, to to Eden, so that's great. Thank thanks for thanks for bringing that up. I really like that. The rabbis also say that if if Adam and and Eve had not had just been able to wait 
a couple more hours and wait until the Sabbath came in, then they would have been given the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Mm. Interesting. Yes. That's interesting. That's yeah, really interesting. That interesting. Um, speaking of uh, being expelled from the garden, uh, what about the, the serpent? So a uh, serpent in uh, Jewish tradition and in, in, in kind of general Christian tradition, uh, there's you know kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the serpent and uh, the figure that Christians call Satan, right? Kind of adversary uh, figure set against God. Um, so in Jewish tradition, how, how do how does our you know the Jewish uh, interpretive tradition handle the serpent? And what the serpent's doing there? Right. Um, it is. It does end up being similar to to the Satan, uh, but there is a, there's a few little interesting things that come out in the Midrash. One is that God, he was really upset with the snake because he had planned to make him king over all the beasts. <laughs> he was the smartest, as we are told. We were actually told he was very smart. And you notice he, he was cursed by being forced to lie on his belly so that the, uh, the, Midrash, the Midrashic tradition says that he was actually standing up and walking around. It was like, it wasn't like the snake as we know him now um, at all. So um, he was this kind of larger than life figure uh, who somehow had, had um, become both arrogant, uh, you know, an animal who had become arrogant, cunning. And also he, had, he was the one who was the sexual tempter. He had a desire for Eve. That's, that, that's very clear in many of the Midrashic stories about the, the serpent. So in order to win over Eve, he created this whole scenario. But um, yeah, it really is something gone wrong uh, through arrogance and desire. The serpent represents it more than Adam and Eve do, who basically just were... <laughs> that were affected by the, the fruit. Um, good, so with that then, uh, the serpent in terms of what happens with the serpent, so that makes sense with the, you know, the serpent is walking around on, on, two, on two feet and then is cursed to crawl on the belly, then there's kind of that transformation, kind of a change in state from, you know, kind of an upright uh, mobile, to something that's lower and limited, uh, so that yeah, so the, as a, a sort of you know punishment, a, lo a low a lowering of state from, yeah. from one to to another, an enmity between the snake and humans. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't exactly. Those curses are are interesting. Also, I mean, the, they they seem to be like. You want to understand why human life is so difficult. Look at what's difficult for the woman. Look at what's difficult for the man. These came from this original um, misunderstanding and disobedience in the garden, but also the animal, the, the animals, um, specifically the snake. But there was an alienation between humans and animals that didn't need to happen. And, and the earth, I mean, Adam is, his curse is to work very hard and he's only gonna have thistles and, you know, it's not gonna be easy. So, yeah. The loss Good. of original wholeness is really uh, the, you know, the overriding theme there. But um, yeah, is, I mean, I don't think there's any question in traditional Judaism, there is an, a, a sense of the reality of evil sometimes personified in uh, Satan, sometimes, um, you know, a, a fallen angel type, sometimes in people who seem to be hopelessly caught in, um, in evil. Well, before we get to uh, audience questions, is there any other um, part of uh, Jewish interpretive tradition of, of Genesis two and three that you wanted to uh, to share with us? Um, 
No, I, I, th I think that the tree of life is j just, I would share that the tree of life also is a major symbol in Jewish mysticism and Jewish mystical traditions. Again, a symbol of wholeness, but also a symbol of the, um, the integrity and the branching out of, of human life, the unity and multiplicity um, becomes, it just becomes a major symbol, but it's a whole nother topic. And I think we're not gonna get into that today. Great. Um, well then, uh, we have lots of questions here uh, from our audience, which I'm excited about. Um, so uh, one of them that, that I think uh, relates to specifically what we talked about with the general interpretation of the Garden of Eden in Jewish tradition, um, one of our audience members asked if the um, if the Jewish community considers the Garden of Eden as a literal garden, or is it just you know strictly an allegory or a metaphor for the way things started with people? What's how how is that typically dealt with? The different ways that that's dealt with in uh, in the Jewish community. So literal, figurative somewhere in between um, what's, uh, what, what, what do you see in, in the Jewish interpretive tradition with Garden of Eden? Well, you know, as a historian, I see literalism as an invention of the modern world. <laughs> I don't think the, diff the distinctions that we make between literal and figurative or literal and um, philosophical or, I don't think those distinctions apply in the same way, although we use the words sometimes, it to the ancient world, to the classical world, certainly to the rabbinic world. There's a respect for what actually happened, but unless you're in the, the business of deciding on a law and a consequence or a law and a permission, it's not so important. So it, it can be figurative, it can be literal. Um, it can be, I like, I like the word archetypal, even though it has a kind of psychological tone because of Jungian psychology and so forth. But the idea that there's, there's an ancient memory here, but it's not a literal memory. It's a memory of our essential natures. And, and things that distort our essential natures. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it does. Uh, so, it, so the distinction between literal and figurative isn't as distinct, you think, at least in, in the minds of the, uh, the early interpreters and even the people who are, who are writing um, the story in Genesis two and three, is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's like um, to focus on that distinction would be to miss miss something important. Okay, good. Um, with uh, let's talk about Eve for a moment. Does the Jewish tradition how how does the Jewish tradition see Eve? Is do they see Eve as being a a, a figure who was wise? Uh, I know in the Christian general Christian tradition, sometimes that's Eve is seen as being, you know, foolish and deceived. Uh, this is a word that uh, you know that Paul uses. Um, so, how how does how does Jewish generally interpret Eve's character and you know person in in the garden? Um, she's a seeker of wisdom. She when the when the serpent tells her that they're, uh, <clears throat> that she won't die if, if she um, touches the fruit. Well, actually she says, she later says, I, I was told not to touch the, the fruit, but that wasn't true. God told them just not to eat the fruit. So she's, she's like, in fact, the rabbi says she added on <laughs> a prohibition that wasn't there. She was wanted to be 
she knew she had to be careful. And yet when she saw what the serpent pointed out, that it's beautiful, it's good, uh, it's good for you to eat, she saw it was true. Um, what she didn't know and couldn't know, and in fact, the story seems to be set up to help us recognize this, is that once you eat that fruit, once you cross that boundary and want to seek the inner knowledge of what's good, you will also encounter what's evil. Before then, there's no, um, there's no, I don't think the word ra, evil, appears except in reference to that tree. Only the word good, everything is good. When God created it, it was good, it was good, it was good. And so, but in that tree was hidden this other piece. So let, let's talk about those two trees. I had another question about the trees. Um, how are those two trees then uh, interpreted generally as what you've seen from what you've read from Jewish uh, interpreters? The two trees, talk to us a bit about how Jewish tradition handles those. It's very confusing. Because <laughs> first we're told there's just one tree, right? That they can't eat. And then after they eat that one, we're told, oh, if now if they go and eat that other tree, <laughs> they're going to live forever. So um, the, it's interesting. In some Jewish art, the two trees are portrayed as intertwined. Um, but the, it actually seems to be um, uh, a <clears throat> like one has to come before the other. And that's what, that's what I understand from the commentaries. Once you cross that boundary of the knowledge of good and evil, then there's also a boundary that you cannot cross, at least in this life, between, um, <clears throat> you can't cross it in, in human life. It's got to be in a, fur a further life. That's, that's what I think the live forever means. But it's a very difficult thing to interpret. I'm not sure I'm giving a very good explanation of that. Okay, so it's so it's something that there's widely different differing opinions in the Jewish interpreted interpretive I tradition. I, I guess I would say I haven't found a satisfactory explanation. Of okay. That. Okay. Okay. Um, so one of the things that that you mentioned was the uh, time. Uh, of of Eden, those that the uh, um, the midrash that you mentioned about the twelve hours of mm. of of the day and what happened within that. Um, one of the things that you mentioned there was Cain and Abel, uh, you know, being right. part of that on an hour that was previous to the last hour when Adam and Eve were uh, expelled from the garden. Right, um, that's so right? is that yeah yeah so did, did so was is, is that's so one one of the audience members was asking if they if they heard that correctly that's what i read i was quoting directly from the, the text in the talmud in english when i when i read that but it is it doesn't you know it's different from what we assume from just the straight reading of those chapters okay so then in that tradition then that there's a strand of jewish tradition that would say uh, that Adam and Eve may have had children before actually leaving Eden. Is that fair to say? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's no. what I understand from that. Um, okay. You know, still babies, but mm -hmm. right. Presumably, so, I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah, so they weren't. Yeah, born at twenty, or that might have been <laughs> why Eve's childbirth was said to be painful. <laughs> Um, I could see that being the case. So yeah, so yeah, that that is that is really uh, really interesting. So again, on this this topic of time, um, you know, so you, the, there were twelve hours delineated. One of our audience members is asking for if, if there's some you know significance in some of those numbers. So twelve hours for the day, you know, daytime hours, nighttime hours, is that we, at what point does that become significant? And really relating to seven. It, day of the week. I think it. I think it's just the culture of the. I mean, rabbinic culture, which was part of ancient um, Roman culture. It's there's not. There's in in the biblical materials. There's 
there's the like dawn and sunset and midday, but I don't know when the 24 hours became significant. So that's a rabbinic, probably rabbinic addition to that. As far as the set, 24 hours and seven days and, and all that, um, uh, you know, some traditional Jews have, have latched on to all the anti-evolutionary um, readings that have come mostly from Christians uh, out of an anxiety that their own tradition might be corrupted. Um, by evolutionary thinking. But um, I, again, I don't think the ancients were very worried about that, the ancient scholars. Thank you. Um, I saw, saw there was a kind of quick follow-up question to the uh, possibility of Cain and Abel being born in Eden or children in Eden prior to having to leave. Um, the the question is is there an understanding as in, in that sense why as to why children who might not have partaken of the fruit from the knowledge of you know the tree of knowledge of good and evil why they were also expelled from would be expelled from the garden is that something that that particular interpretation teases out or does it is that not a question that seems to concern it doesn't seem to be picked up by the main line of tradition. Women, I mean, children are considered uh, innocent in the sense of unable to discriminate between good and evil until they're 12 for girls and 13 for boys. Um, but that that particular piece isn't linked to that so far as I know, that piece of can enable. Great. Um, uh... Another question here that relates to something that you mentioned about the garden and the relationship of humanity to the garden and humanity to the animals. Um, the question here is to what degree uh, do the Jewish uh, you know, community um, read a duty of earth care or uh, environmentalism in the creation uh, and the Garden of Eden story? At least in your, in, in your personal experience and from what you've read. Um, there's, there's clearly hints of concern about some of the same issues, not necessarily saying that they're coming from the same place as we come as modern people. But first of all, Adam and Eve were given permission to eat vegetables, not meat. Doesn't seem like meat eating was even brought up <laughs> until after Noah. Um, there's uh, the idea of <clears throat> tending the garden um, is in Genesis 1 seems to have a different, um, I'm sorry, no, I guess it's the beginning of Genesis 2, has a different flavor than, um, you know, you're going to have to wrestle with the earth to, to get food out of it to, to fight those thistles and so forth so you know there's there's a sense of a wholeness as i said before that was once there and then certain things in jewish law come out much later like not taking fruit of the trees until the fourth year and um and not um not taking the babies from the nest of a mother bird unless she's gone and things like that. There, there are lots of little things about caring for animals, caring for the earth, but they don't amount in themselves to a full-fledged environmental um, program or anything. But they're certainly, you know, we're supposed to love the earth just as um, Adam loved, Adam and Eve loved the garden. There's no hint that they were um, had to do anything else except show up and take care of us. Good. Uh, yeah, and, and that was a topic that uh, the uh, mentioned that Tamar uh, is part of the Latter-day Saint Jewish Academic Dialogue Project. Uh, the most recent uh, gathering for that talked about environmentalism um, and care for the uh, you know, stewardship uh, over uh, the earth. 
um, as part of that. And so I know, you know Tamar has read a lot uh, in that and has some some great thoughts. And I wish we had more time to to be able to draw from from some of that. But yeah, so so what you're saying is there's no systematic program for how the Jewish community should approach environment or you know earth care. Rather, there's individual parts of how to do that. The individual parts like, for example, the Levites li lived in cities um, and weren't given land, but they had to have, there, there was a provision that they had to have gardens, uh, essentially land around them. They, they couldn't, it, it was, I think it was inconceivable for people in earlier ages not to have some connection to the land but they were often, often struggling with it too, struggling to rest a living you know, from, from farming and so forth. So just a very different relationship than we have today because of our, uh, our technology, which is um, amazing and miraculous. And we wouldn't be here doing this if it weren't for our technology, but it's, it's brought in a lot of things that we have to really deal with in a different way now. Um, okay, so because uh, we're getting close to the end here, um, something I think re relating to a question that one of the audience members has, I kind of would love to tie this into um, you personally and your reading the Garden of Eden story. So one of, one of the audience members has asked, what are some of the advantages of reading the story of the Garden of Eden in Hebrew uh, versus in English translation, if there are things that there are flavors uh, ideas that kind of come across more in Hebrew than in English. And kind of along with that, I'd love to also kind of maybe pair that with um, how this story has impacted you, what your kind of personal devotional approach to the Garden of Eden has been something you found meaningful in that. So maybe we can combine those two if it's possible. <clears throat> the, the Hebrew language is full of nuances. But it's also often you find in the Bible puns, and there's a significant pun, um, so to speak, a homophone, I guess. There are two words that are pronounced or. One is light, the word for light is or, and the one for skin is or, but one is spelled with an aleph and the other with an ayin. Aleph and ayin are both silent vowels. So when God, um, after, after Adam and Eve realize what has happened to them, they go and make themselves garments of fig leaves. But then it says, God made them garments of skin, using the word for skin, but it can also be transposed in the, into the word for light, hinting that originally they had garments of light and now they have only garments of skin, only for protection. The inner light has been dimmed. Um, so it's interpretations like that that, um, that touch me very much. Um, and, and reading in Hebrew, I'm, you know, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I read with I can read the Hebrew, but I also read commentaries that tell me what, what I'm reading, uh, tell me alternative interpretations. So it really is much, much richer with just a little knowledge of Hebrew even. Um, I will say that. Um, yeah, and also I'll say just in terms of the devotional aspect, our Rosh Hashanah, our new year is said to be the day of the creation of Adam and Eve. There were six days, and then there was on, <clears throat> on, that, on that last day, the sixth day, that was Rosh Hashanah. So every Rosh Hashanah, I also like to study the story of Adam and Eve. Great. Thank you. Okay, I think that's a great, as, as, I would love to keep talking with you and hearing <laughs> uh, more from you. Um, but thank you so much for spending the time with us and our audience uh, this evening. This has been great. Um, and I uh, just wanted to let everyone know here uh, that uh, you can rewatch this event, uh, study it uh, on our YouTube channel, um, uh, the Wizard Foundation's YouTube channel, um, and we're going to begin making these available as podcasts uh, as well. So 
Um, you can find information uh, for both of those on the WIDSO Foundation's website, www.widsofoundation.org. Um, and the WIDSO Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we're entirely funded by our generous audience members. So if you find what we're doing here valuable uh, in any way, please consider making a tax deductible donation, uh, again, at the WIDSO Foundation's website. Uh, widsofoundation.org uh, uh, forward slash donate. Um, and we're excited for, again, this is kind of kicking off this entire series here with people like uh, Tamar, you kind of got a, a sense for uh, the, the sort of friends that we have that we're excited to, to talk with. Our next conversation is going to be in uh, a few weeks, January 23rd. Um, we'll be discussing the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 with Rabbi Mark Diamond, who's a good friend of, of Tamar's uh, and, and ours at the, the Woodso Foundation. Um, so um, uh, they're both part of the Latter-day Saint Jewish Academic Dialogue uh, Project, kind of the original uh, team uh, that kind of started that, that, that whole thing. So, um, so please come back then. Again, thank you for joining us this evening and please have a good night and a safe and happy new year. Thanks.